Thanks very much for attending this afternoon. That was a great talk by Vinny. I will refer to it during mine. There were some points he made which were very interesting. As Jeff mentioned, my name is Paul Chen. I'm a director of product management for Daiquiri. I work on our device operating systems as well as one of our new WorkSense applications, which is the subject of today's talk. The title is AR Productivity 101, powered by Daiquiri WorkSense. I'll explain what Daiquiri WorkSense is, but in general, we're trying to bring AR to our customers so that their workforces can actually benefit through the use of AR in their day-to-day -day jobs. Those of you who are familiar with Daiquiri know that we've been building professional-grade augmented reality for about eight years now. We are headquartered down in Los Angeles. We do have offices in Europe as well. Over the past eight years, we've had hundreds of conversations with our customers about how they plan to use augmented reality, how they can use it to enhance their workforces. That's our goal. What we've heard, what they've told us, and what we've learned is that their workforces can really benefit from the use of AR when those workforces are performing complex tasks on high value assets. Now those assets can be buildings, they can be factories, uh, they can be the facilities or the equipment inside those buildings and factories. It can be assembly lines in a factory. It can be even the things that come off the assembly lines like airplanes or tractors. All through those assets' life cycles, their workforces are performing complex tasks from the initial concept and design of those assets through the building, the implementation, construction of those assets then into the multi-years of operation and maintenance of those assets, then finally to retrofitting, remodeling, giving those assets a second life. Through all of those phases, their workforces are doing very complicated tasks, and they found that augmented reality could really help those workers become more productive, more accurate, uh, more efficient, reduce downtimes, improve uh, cost reductions, profitability. We've seen studies about how AR can help workers in these situations. What workers have needed, though, is software to help them do that. I understand this is the developed track. Uh, it's a little odd for me because what I'm touting today is that right out of the box, Daiquiri is now providing software applications that our customers can use to derive benefit from AR immediately. But don't worry, not all hope is lost. We do have APIs available also because we understand customers always want something a little bit different than what we offer. There is ample opportunity to create bespoke custom applications using our APIs. Customers have also told us that augmented reality is not the point. They're not just buying it for fun. They want to actually use it and get uh, benefit from it. So at Daiquiri, we understand we have to package up a complete solution. So we have developed both the hardware. Uh, two years ago, we introduced the Daiquiri Smart Helmet. Some of you may be familiar with that product. Last year at AWE, we announced our uh, smart glasses, which is on the market currently today. And at this year's AWE, we're announcing our software suite, which is called WorkSense. And it's essentially a suite of five productivity apps for AR that give our customers <coughs> AR benefits right out of the box. We package up the hardware with the software, now with also integrations to back-end business systems so that customers can access all that leveraged um, existing content and make it available in their glasses. In all of those conversations we had with the customers, they told us what their workforce needs were and we heard a lot of repeating uh, stories from them. And we were able to bucket them into five essential categories or tasks. The first one is very common, show. Uh, this applies to all markets, all industries. A worker is out in the field or in the factory, comes across something that is either abnormal or unfamiliar, and would like to get help. They want to show this issue to somebody else. This is very prevalent in the market today. It goes by other names such as remote expert, remote assistant, remote assistance. Uh, in the healthcare field, it's telemedicine, so very, very common use case. We captured that as a task we call show, and we are now developing, or have developed, uh, an application that we call show that allows someone wearing smart glasses to show that uh, issue or case to a remote expert. A second use case that we heard repeatedly was the ability to scan their existing environment. I heard a talk yesterday from the US Navy. They design their modern ships using 3D models. 
But they find that once the ship goes to sea, gets deployed, there are changes made. New equipment gets installed, changes in configurations get made. Clearly, they don't have time to go back and update the 3D models, so they need a way to go and scan what exists so that they can further plan other changes, other retrogrades, or up upgrades, retrofits. So we have captured that need as a task we call scan, and we're developing an application that runs on the glasses to enable you to view uh, your existing surroundings and in real time build a 3D mesh or a scanned environment. The third example is called tag. We heard a use case where workforces are in their environment and they want to see priority data about certain assets that they're looking at. Uh, they want to see performance data, asset maintenance data. We have now an application that we call tag that allows you to now access that data in context, in situ, on the assets that you're looking at. And that's actually the focus of this talk. So the, uh, the remainder of this talk will be about tag. But just to round out the other two applications that we're talking about, uh, there's a need to work with models. Obviously, this is very common in the AEC, uh, architecture, engineering, construction industry. They work with 2D drawings, 3D models. They want to be able to view them in augmented reality in context of the site they're using so that they can check designs with clients. Uh, they can make sure that equipment is laid out properly, materials are installed properly and even good for retrofitting and remodeling uh, construction later. So we've captured that as a need we call model and we're developing an application that would work on the smart glasses right away. And finally, guide. Uh, all workforces often need work instructions from novices doing the tasks for the first few times, even for seasoned ex uh, experienced professionals. Sometimes the work instructions change. Sometimes things are updated. Sometimes they need uh, to be reminded on not to skip steps. So providing work instructions in augmented reality enables them to make sure everything is done properly and accurately. And we've captured that as an app that we now call Guide. But today I'll focus on TAG. So for the rest of this talk, we'll talk about TAG. I'll show you how you can use TAG using our smart glasses. Uh, I have a video that shows you what that looks like. Then we'll go sort of behind the scenes on how you set up TAG. All of this is done using the app itself. But there is, again, ample opportunity to use APIs to develop uh, custom bespoke apps. And then finally, we'll talk about some use cases so that uh, you might start thinking about how customers might start using TAG in their environments. We're giving TAG sort of the tagline of just-in-place asset data. This, of course, is an analogy to just-in-time inventory management. We're now providing the ability to get the right data at the right place so the right person at the right time can do the right things, make the right decision, and save a lot of money and make us all more profitable. Basically, you are creating virtual content, which is attached to physical items, so now you have augmented reality, and then you configure those tags to connect to your back-end enterprise systems. So whether it's an IBM Maximo asset management system, uh, whether it's SAP Leonardo, it could also be performance data, IBM Watson IoT, uh, Siemens MindSphere, AWS IoT platform. Your enterprise has lots of data. Typically, it's available to someone sitting at his or her desk using a browser-based dashboard. But for the worker on the shop floor or in the factory looking at the asset, they often don't have access to that information unless, of course, they're saddled with a laptop or a tablet. The advantage of viewing this information live through the smart glasses, of course, is that since it's head-worn, the worker's hands are free. And the worker can continue to use tools, manipulate equipment, do things while having that, uh, uh, the information available right in their view. I have a video showing you what TAG looks like. This video was shot through our Daiquiri smart glasses. The smart glasses have the capability to record exactly what the user sees, both through the see-through displays as well as the augmented reality content. This is in one of our Daiquiri labs. I will attempt to control this video. I'll start and stop it at certain points. So I'm wearing the smart glasses, and I knew it would do that. The control always disappears too quickly. I want to stop it just at the beginning. So you see this application header. This is the tag application. It's very minimal so that it's unobtrusive to the user who's trying to do some task or perform some work. Uh, essentially, Tags are placed in the real world, and we group them into what we call workspaces. There's a, a place in your environment that you are now tagging. 
So the first thing a user might do is look at the information about that workspace to make sure he or she is looking at the right set of tags. So there's information about the workspace. You can sort of see it here. One caveat is that our field of view camera is very wide, and the actual augmented content looks a bit small. But I trust, uh, trust me that when I tell you when you put on the smart glasses, come see us in the booth, it's actually quite bright and large in your field of view. So what I'm doing now is I'm looking at tags that are attached to that black piece of equipment with the display down in the bottom uh, left side. The tags are going to present information about that asset. My job as a, an inspector is now to do some performance monitoring on that asset. You might recognize that asset. It's, it's a portable nuclear fusion reactor, just like we all have at home. Maybe yours is newer and smaller than the, we have, the one we have in our lab, but essentially we power our labs and most of Southern California using this reactor. But my job is now to monitor the performance. Um, the tags are located in space, but connected to the machine. I see the tag closest to the fusion reactor is red. That indicates to me that there's probably an issue. A little bit before in the video, when the tags are far away, they're just uh, iconified as small circles. So if you have, say, tens or hundreds of tags in your workspace, you're not deluged with a lot of information, but we retain the status of those tags. So I can immediately pick out red tags in the sea of tags in front of me and quickly hone in on those pieces of equipment that need attention. So continuing on with the video and the story, when I hover over the tag using our gaze and dwell UI paradigm, some information immediately opens up about the tag. So in this case, we're looking at the core temperature of this particular asset. This nuclear reactor is on the IoT. It's sending data back up into the cloud. I've configured my tag to access that data, and now, as a technician walking up, with the smart glasses, I can now access this back-end uh, performance data. I can see the temperature of the core is at 157 million degrees Kelvin, very normal for a fusion reactor, so I'm not concerned about that. There must be something else that's causing the issue. So I can expand this tag. We have the ability to connect multiple pieces of information to a tag. Our user interface displays six at a time. You might have multiple pages of six. But essentially, uh, you can view multiple pieces of data about any particular asset. So in this case, besides the core temperature, we're looking at the power input, 763 megawatts going into the reactor to make sure all the plasma stays contained. That's, for, again, very normal. The internal pressure is 43 million gigapascals. Again, it's in the normal range for a nuclear reactor. I want to make sure I'm working on the correct, correct reactor. There's a photo of the reactor here, which can be expanded. Uh, this information could also be asset serial number information from a Maximo database. It can be any kind of information. In this case, I expand uh, the photo to make sure I'm looking at the right model of the reactor. And then finally, there's another parameter called the lithium blanket integrity. It's at a certain level of percentage. I may not know what that means, so there's some text here that explains what it is. It's hard to read again, but in the glasses, it's quite clear. It explains that the lithium blanket prevents high energy neutrons from exiting the reactor and causing physical bodily harm to my tissues. If it's below 85%, then I'm going to start to feel the onset of birth defects. And so right now it's 68%. I'm not feeling very healthy. Posted on the column is some safety protocol information. And very fortunately, the very first piece of information is if the lithium blanket integrity is less than 85%, then go turn this knob on the reactor and increase the lithium blanket. So luckily, my hands are free. I've got smart glasses on. Meanwhile, I've pinned the integrity chart in the world space. And as I crank the dial, I see the integrity is increasing. I'm feeling healthier and healthier. And I'm probably happy I won't be growing a third arm anytime soon. So now that I've rectified the situation, I can mark my tag status as green. Everything's back to normal. I can then unpin this information, close it and then close the safety protocol data that I had uh, referred to. So TAG here has helped me inspect, monitor, get data about this asset, and perform some maintenance through troubleshooting. In the past, I might have had to call somebody back at, at a control room, tell me what are those parameters, which one's out of line. That person might not be available at that moment. They might be doing something else. So then the uh, issue would be delayed, and I would be irradiated probably uh, in a very irreversible manner. So in this use of tags can definitely help my, work, uh, my workflow. 
So now you've seen how tags work. Let's talk about how to set them up. Uh, I mentioned there are workspaces. This is how you organize your tags in the environment. You might have multiple places in your environment where you've got tags set up, different workspaces. You need to tell the application which set of tags you want to work with. So you scan what we call a workspace selector. This is simply a QR code that's mounted somewhere in the environment. You scan that with the glasses, and now the glasses knows I'm working with this set of tags. Finally, you need to register those tags in the world. Uh, obviously, it would be great if we had object recognition, if we could look at any particular piece of equipment and know that it was nuclear reactor model 1005 and place the tags right on it. The Vuforia talk we just heard, very interesting stuff. Their model targets is definitely on the right track. You heard all the best practices. There are caveats where the models work, don't work. It's, it's an unsolved problem yet. We're making good progress. Uh, but for now, we have to rely on a visual target. So in the workspace, you'll place a visual image target. We call it the landmark. After scanning that target with the glasses, you've basically told the system that is the origin of my coordinate system, and tags are then displayed relative to that landmark. Then you can create tags. It's actually quite simple to create tags. You don't need any extra software, any extra hardware. You don't have to get a consultant with a contract. You can do it all yourself using the smart glasses. You have user interface that allows you to create new tags, place them where you want in the environment, on the assets, next to gauges, valves, buttons, et cetera. You can provide them names. And then you'll want to configure them to connect potentially to your backend system so they can show data. This is typically done with fairly text-centric URLs, RESTful APIs, OPC DA calls, et cetera. So this is best done, say, using a computer. And we've, based, uh, we've created a tag web application, a companion app, where after you create your tags, you can then go on the web and very easily configure them. So another quick video. I'm back in my Daiquiri lab working on my nuclear reactor. There are two tags associated with that reactor, the data tag that we saw earlier and the safety protocols. I'm now going to add a new tag. I get a little icon. This is now placing the tag in the world. I place it in the XY, and then I place it in the Z. I find it useful to often step to the side, and I can really gauge the Z depth. So I have a new tag I'm placing on the column. It, of course, has no content yet since I just created it, but I will edit its name. And what I want to do is show, say, the asset maintenance schedule so the technician can come up and realize when things need to be done and at what time. So we have an on-screen keyboard in our glasses. I'm going to change the name of the tag to, say, schedule. And then I'll save the name. Clearly, you don't want to be typing an extremely long RESTful API using this on-screen keyboard. So I'll set the tag status to be yellow advisory. This is information. I save the tag. And now there it is, present in my user interface. And then what I want to do is then configure it. So I go to the web. I go to the tag web application. I sign in using my Daiquiri credentials. And then I get a list of all the workspaces to which I have access. In this particular case, we're working with the uh, nuclear fusion reactor NFR4 workspace. So I just click on that. And I enter into that workspace. I see the tags. There's the safety protocols tag and the nuclear fusion data tag. And now the newest created tag is the schedule tag. So I want to configure this. I click into that tag. Again, there's no data here, uh, there yet, but I'm going to add some content now. Click the button. I'm going to add an image. And in this case, I'm accessing my Maximo database, which stores an image of the particular asset maintenance schedule. So after having typed all that in, I click Save. Now this tag has a piece of content. It's called Maintenance Schedule. And you can see the URL for uh, the path to getting that image. Then I go back to the glasses. This is immediately available. The server is already synced. Um, we pull data every two seconds on the glasses. Going back to my new tag, I, uh, just for proof, this is the same workspace. Every two seconds, we pull the data. There's the 154 uh, Kelvin that the Fusion Reactor currently is running. Then I go up to my new schedule tag, and now attached to it is a JPEG of the maintenance schedule for each of the components of the reactor and the time periods that uh, maintenance needs to be performed. So this is useful information that I think the technicians will use when they're doing their inspections. 
So I just walked you through a use case of performance monitoring. I was an inspector looking at that particular reactor. I was able to get live performance data from my backend systems. Performance monitoring is sort of a subcase or a subset of a general inspection case. Tag is also very useful for this particular use case. You can set up tags so that your inspectors know exactly what to inspect. They don't skip things. They do them in the right order. Great for novices, even good for experienced inspectors. It's also useful for asset maintenance. Scheduled periodic maintenance can have tags uh, that are associated with them. The technicians can come look at the assets, know exactly what needs to be done. You can even attach work instructions or job plans to those tags. So not only do they know what needs to be done and when, but they have instructions on what to do. You can attach videos, you can attach PDFs, other manuals to give that information. Those three use cases, performance monitoring, inspections, asset maintenance, those use sort of static pre-configured tags where you set them up in advance a priori. You have a subject matter expert or an admin. And then your users use them on their daily jobs, whether they're inspecting things on an hourly basis, daily, weekly, monthly. But when they're doing those tasks, they might often find a problem. Uh, there might be a piece of equipment where a dial is stuck or a particular valve won't open. The thing is too tight or it's rusted shut. Maybe there's a pipe that's leaking sulfuric acid onto the person's boot. This is not good. You can also use tag to mark issues. These are sort of dynamic ephemeral tags. Uh, you can drop a tag, just like I showed you uh, in the video. You can then take a photo of the particular issue, attach it to the tag. You might uh, attach some text as well. And then the technician coming back later wearing the smart glasses can immediately find that issue. As it happens, I was in this room two weeks ago giving a talk uh, at IoT World, and a light in this corner, which is not on right now because it's broken, was at that time on the fritz, and it was on a duty cycle of every 60 seconds. So it would be 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, and at that time, the screen was almost right in front of it. It was very distracting for the audience. I wanted to notify facilities. I was too short, unfortunately, to put a piece of tape on that light to, so they would know which one, but if I had my smart glasses, I could easily put a virtual tag there, and then the te technician would know exactly which light still needs to be fixed. And the final use case that we've heard from customers is training. So for all of those other use cases with the static tags, you can set those tags up and easily train new employees on those processes, just having them wear the glasses and go through the steps. If you're uncomfortable with the trainees using the actual equipment, you can clone that workspace and just use a landmark in a lab. So then they scan that landmark with their glasses, it's the same set of tags, and they can go through them, except now they're not actually playing with the actual equipment, won't set off alarms, et cetera. These are some use cases we've heard from customers. We'd be happy to hear more about uh, how you think your customers might use TAG as well. So in summary, we've included WorkSense TAG with our Daiquiri Smart Glasses. It's part of our new AR productivity suite that we call WorkSense. It, it provides just-in-place data placement the right data at the right place for the right people at the right time to do the right things. You can use tags in two different ways, either pre-configuring a set for routine inventory maintenance and uh, uh, performance monitoring, asset maintenance in, uh, inspections, or you can use tags dynamically to create ephemeral tags to essentially annotate your world, marking issues, requests for information, snags in other industries. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we are at booth 305 in the exhibit hall. Please come visit us. You can try on our glasses. You can try TAG for yourself. You may have heard my colleague David Beard speak yesterday about WorkSense. If you're here now, you can't hear my other colleague Cassie speaking. She's finishing up at this moment as well in the work track. And our CEO, Roy Oshek, will be speaking tomorrow at 9 in the morning. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. Yes? Does it have any voice recognition? Currently, our smart glasses have microphones, but we have not yet implemented voice recognition as part of the product. We have done some proofs of concept using voice recognition, both stored locally for, say, onboard commands, as well as in the cloud. We were using IoT speech recognition. We haven't heard a strong use case for it yet from customers. Some people do want to use it when they're in quieter environments. We were on board or on site with a pharmaceutical company in their uh, facilities 
air handling units, and the fans were so loud you could barely hear each other talk, and they said it wouldn't work, it's too loud. So until we get a stronger use case, we probably won't put it in the product, but technologically we know how to do it. Yes? So the question is, uh, in Daiquiri's experience, as you noticed, we have offices both in the US and EMEA. We're doing, of course, worldwide sales. It seems that Daiquiri has seen more adoption of AR in general uh, in Europe than in the US. Uh, it's hard to quantify. We have had wins in both geographies, both uh, regions. It's hard to say that the, the uh, European contingent is further along than the US, but... Um, Do you see like, different So the question actually is, do we see a difference in the types of enterprises in Europe that are adopting it versus in the US? Uh, maybe so in the types, but again, the use cases that it comes down to are pretty much the same. And, that's why we're developing the WorkSense with those five essential tasks, show, scan, tag, model, guide. Those five things seem to be common no matter what the industry. So although it might be, not saying it is, but it could be automotive and manufacturing in Europe, maybe it's pharmaceuticals and healthcare in the US, they all boil down to those same sets of requirements though. Yes. Do we have any plans in the future for creating home sense? Currently, uh, I think the state of AR is that I think generally we feel, everyone at this conference feels, it's not yet ready for consumers for home use. We're focusing mostly on industrial, just like the mobile phone did at first to get it. Uh, wider adoption and traction. So for now, we've got WorkSense. If those sets of functions, or if there are more common functions or tasks that crop up in home use, then definitely uh, we would love to see our glasses in wide use and homes, and we would provide software for that as well. But no current plans as of yet. Yes? What is the effective field of view for seeing the markers? The field of view in our smart glasses is a 44 degree diagonal. So it's a little bit bigger than HoloLens, but I would say that effectively it looks bigger because the HoloLens is a bit further out from your face and so you get more of the letterbox. Ours is quite close to your eyes so that it apparently looks bigger. But we're all challenged with the same laws of physics right now. We're all trying to attack that. Field of view is clearly one of the, the things that we have to improve and we're working on it.